Who was El Chapo? El Chapo was a part of the leadership, or at least a faction of the leadership in, in the cartel. It's a federation of different, uh, of small organizations. Well, I'd say small organizations. Basically, families or organizations that uh, conf conform this larger group, which is the, the Sinaloa cartel that is based out of Sinaloa. Basically, f uh, they are people that uh, have a family and power nucleuses there in Sinaloa. I mean... Uh, who was he? I think he was a he was a high level operator for the Sinaloa cartel. He uh, he had his own drug routes, his own uh, networks. His family is uh, his family uh, nucleus down there is still in control of some of those operations. So his arrest really didn't change anything. Um, but he wasn't the, the mastermind number one leader that I think the media and the government kind of portrayed him as. You know, who was the mastermind? <sighs> If you go down there and you read uh, what most of the uh, brave journalists in Mexico that we have uh, say, another aspect of this war is that a lot of journalists get killed. I think Mexico has a, I think has some of the top numbers in the world. And this is an, not no secret to anybody. Uh, El Mayo Zambada is the, is the name of the the historical figurehead of this cartel, or at least somebody who people theorize or suspect to be the, uh, the, the the main guy or the main person that is in charge of some of, of, of this criminal group. Is as he far. still alive? That's the going rumor that he's still very much alive. And the interesting thing about him is that he learned his craft in Los Angeles. So people thinking that Sinaloa cartel isn't a Mexican thing. It's actually, uh, he, uh, he apparently learned a lot of his craft from uh, people in the United States, you know. The, and that's the craft of leadership, the craft of business, the craft, the which, craft which of, aspect of the craft? The craft of getting a product from Colombia, putting it through Mexico. And oh, the then, logistics. The logistics part of it. You know. And he somehow is uh, operating in the shadows. So he's not a known entity. I don't have a clear number of this, but he was interviewed by a magazine called Proceso in Mexico. And some pictures were taken of him. It was over 10 years ago, probably. And that's the last time anybody's ever seen a picture of him. What's it like to be a journalist in that? So uh, <sighs> can, can a journalist have a conversation with him and live? Not unless he asks to, ha to have that conversation. I think he, he reached out to this uh, journalist to talk about it. Um, there's a... There's a media wing uh, to the work that we do, a sister page called Demoler. And and it's uh, run by some pretty good people. And the way we met is that I was basically training them how to work in hostile environments. And they were like, oh, we're gonna go report on cartel activity in Mexico. And I was like, oh, you know, that is a year and a half ago, a reporter went to the president's daily briefing uh, press conference that he has. They call them La Mañaneras, President and the, uh, the President uh, Manu uh, Manuel Lopez Obrador, and told him to his face, like, uh, I have threats on my life. They're trying to kill me. And it happened. There's been a slew of assassinations and murders of members of the press all over Mexico. It's not an easy job. Uh, either they say too much or they say things that favor one side or the other, which is another aspect of it that is interesting. I don't, I don't consider myself a reporter. I don't report on the news in Mexico. I have friends that do that very well. I commentate on some of it only. Uh, but you see a lot of these uh, cartel reporters go down there, talk to a specific side, and basically speak one side of the story. And that is not something that the other side wants. You know, if you. If you go down there and speak to one side, you're saying what they want people to know or hear. So in a way, you're kind of spreading some of their cartel propaganda in a way. And that's how some people, you know, get shot. Do you think it's possible to go in there and have a conversation with a cartel leader? Well, Sean Penn. Or somebody right? like me, for somebody like Sean Penn. This is what I will say. Uh, after, after that whole Sean Penn thing, I think a lot of people would reconsider a meeting with anybody of any level that has any notoriety here in the United States. They don't. They wouldn't trust anybody to get that close. Um, there are people out there that will talk to reporters. You know, people that are working on a on a lab laboratory somewhere in a hillside somewhere down down south. You know, in the Sierra. 
uh, you know, low level people that get authorization to speak to reporters and stuff like that, but they don't say anything that isn't being taught or, or shown in various different ways or outlets out there for them. I mean, some of these guys have Instagram accounts, you know, some of these guys have blog about it, you know, but they, not the leaders, TikTok. No, not the leaders. I think after what happened to, to El Chapo Guzman, I think that, that, uh, that opportunity, that window was closed, uh, for, for some of the leadership down there. I think. I disagree. I think uh, they're just more sensitive, th realizing that there has to be a deep trust. It's not just anybody and not any high profile. I've gotten a chance to speak to some very high profile leaders that don't speak to journalists and they understand the value of trust. If they have something to say, which I don't think they do, you know, I don't think they, unless at some point in the future, which is something I suspect might, it might be coming, that there is some sort of armed intervention and or external attack on some of these criminal groups that really puts the pressure on them. You don't think there's a, a human aspect to this, of a human being wanting their story to be known versus, yeah. versus this is different than the propaganda machine of I have something to say, I have some message to put out there to play the game of politics and power and money and all that kind of stuff. Isn't there also a human being underneath all that armor that for for the sake of perhaps ego, legacy, wants to be understood? I think in a way they already do that. Uh, there's corridos, which are basically Mexican folk songs that get uh, that get uh, sung about some of them. So in a way, some of these some of these singers are reporting on some of their lives and it's like a it's a great honor to have a corrido made about you you know i, I somebody somebody made a corrido about me based on my interviews right yeah. i didn't pay for it so it's a real one yeah it's it feels cool so right? creating a myth the legend of the man i think it's about uh i think a way you can you can find somebody like that is somebody that wants to get their story specifically clear and straight uh you know coming from that culture and getting to work for the government down there and then not being not working for the government down there and being on the outside being critical of not only the government that is in place now but also the government that I actually work with uh, I can tell you that there's villains all over the place down there everybody's a villain you know at, at, at all levels in, in some way shape or form and some of these people I think in a way including El Chapo I think that some of that that meeting was about film rights and, and and stories and being able to get his story out there i think i don't i'm not i'm not too sure because i wasn't there but i suspect that some of that was going on if you can bring an honest voice down there they can trust to put that out there yeah i mean i think you, I, I think you could try i'm interested in that kind of thing i um because ultimately in some of those places like inside a cartel at the very top is when you can really look at the raw aspects of human nature in a way you can't necessarily elsewhere. There's a youth coming into power down there. And when I say a youth, I mean some of the old guard is going out and some of the new guard is coming in. Uh, an example of this is uh, El Chapo Guzman's uh, sons, who are now in their own right kind of getting gaining legendary status. Uh, his, uh, his son, there was an attempted arrest on his son that led to the uh, famous Culiacanazo incident, uh, which we are now learning more about because some of the Guacamaya leaks are kind of speaking more about what happened that day. Uh, basically a federal operation uh, to, they say to, to arrest El Chapo Guzman's uh, son, um, turned into a siege to try and get him free. They uh, called in the cavalry, basically the whole of the Sinaloa cartel showed up to try and rescue him. Interesting thing about that is in reading some of the documents and also just seeing some of the videos and stuff like that came out of that incident. The cartels were the ones evacuating the citizenship from the area. They were the ones going restaurant to restaurant saying, hey, if you want to exit the city, go through here, take your families, get down, but you have to leave because the army's coming here and they're going to fight us. Um, so there's like a deep morality too to all of that. Underneath the violence, there's a humanity. I mean, it's their home. Yeah. It is their home, uh, and they were fighting for their home, and they were fighting for leadership from their home. Uh, there is a morality, there is a humanity there, and again, I don't. Uh, if people want to paint them all with the villainy aspects, you know, uh, 
that's i mean everybody's a villain in every in somebody else's story you know if we if you kind of look at it that way people should check out your patreon you should check out your field notes you have, you're a really good writer your instagram too you write about you have a quote in your field notes about villains quote i once worked for a villain a savior to some and a biblical demon of old to others a true product of his environment he was the best and the worst of us we're all potential villains in someone else's story he would say to us as you as we would head out into the unknowns that the night had waiting for us it was during one of these nights that i looked around me and saw horns and pitchforks among my people and realized what he meant we were no knights of the round table whatever we were we were needed in the end i guess that justified most of what was about to happen uh, do you think El Chapo, do you think people like him are good or evil? I think there's no one without the other. I think there's a there's a cost to there's a cost to uh their goodness that they do. You know, the roads they build, the hospitals, the career paths that they pay for. Uh there's there there are doctors in Mexico that their careers were paid for by some of these groups. Uh and they do a lot of amazing good for the community. I remember there was a uh a surgeon uh, reconstructing cleft palates. In one of my travels that I did out there, I, uh, I had I spent some time actually going out there be after I got out of the job to train people in the the type of stuff that I show people, and uh, they uh, they told me like I, I told them like you're doing God's work. This stuff this stuff is like legit. This is God's work. You know, building smiles for people. I said like, yeah, and then can I talk to you? Yeah. He said, you know, my career path was paid for by cartel, a group of cartel members. They paid for my career path because they wanted somebody on hand that could fix their teeth. Do you think some aspect of that is just sort of manipulative control or is some of it also just, again, a care for the population, for fellow human beings I, that are one of your own? I think both, you know, I think there's, again, it's hard to it's hard to just make them saints or, or devils, you know. The, uh, the the some of the good they do in some of their communities, and don't ask anything for in return, you know. Uh, and even if they don't ask it for anything in return, where the military shows up, they are immediately melt, met with rocks and roadblocks and everybody's uh, main weapon down there. Since uh, most uh, Mexicans can't buy or own firearms, their their main weapon down there is silence and their eyes to report to the people that they uh, consider the good guys in their environment, right? So that's a hard question, you know? I think uh, I think there's a bit of both, and both the, the government and the criminal groups that are operating down there. Silence is their main weapon. So El Chapo is currently in prison. Is he worth talking to? I'd say yes. Is there things that to you are interesting about him that is still not understood? Is he a window into something that you don't understand about that world still? I think, or are curious about in that world? I think he's a window into the family dynamics of that world. When I say family dynamics, uh, Mexico has a big thing about compadres, you know, and hermanos. Like we have people that we call family that are not necessarily our family. Uh, he is somebody that witnessed the, the, the construction of what is now the Sinaloa cartel, like he was in it way back when he started off as a as a farmer and then went into trafficking. He's uh, from a town called Bandira Huata, which is basically, you know, that's the uh, the Wakanda of cartels. Basically, that's where a lot of that originates. Um, the the things that he saw as far as how some of these things got built, I think, would be an interesting uh, topic of conversation with somebody like him. So that story is a story of evolving family dynamics. So yeah. part of the story of the cartel is individual humans marrying other families, uh, getting uh, getting named the padrino, basically godfathers to other people's kids, um, forming family and blood ties and influence ties to people not only in Mexico but in the United States. And seeing how that dynamic and family dynamic is still there, you know. He, he, so he's gone. He's in prison, but he is. He's probably on his way to be our next. Uh, clandestine saint you go to the uh the chapel of malverde 
Malverde is basically a Mexican Robin Hood uh, folk saint down there who uh, is a saint of traffickers. And at his shrine, you have a small little chapel shrine right next to it. So he's on his way to sainthood in Mexico. You know, not not recognized by the Catholic Church, but that doesn't matter in Mexico anymore. Speaking to somebody like him, who you can consider him somebody that lost, you know, he's, he's arrested, but his family's okay. His, uh, his legacy is out there. He's going to be named, he's probably going to be the next folk saint when he passes away. Do you think he feels like the new wave of what the cartel has become has betrayed him and left him behind? Or... Um, because it seems like the way the cartel operated has changed over the decades. Yeah. Well, number one, their power and influence is bigger. You know, uh, they, there are Sinaloa cartel operations in Colombia, straight from, straight to the, like in the source of it. And, uh, then there are clear, uh, they have a clear presence in, in places like Chicago and Los Angeles. Uh, they're in the United States, the whole thought process that a lot of Americans have, like, oh, we don't want that, that uh, trouble over here. We don't want them to get here, or, like build a wall and all this. So they're deeply integrated into legitimate businesses. I mean, they've been having kids and families up here since for a long time. Uh, some of these people have pass American passports that work not only directly for them, but have blood ties down there. You know, there's been dragnets and arrest of some of these uh, uh, criminal organizations uh, stateside. New Generation Cartel had one, two, three years ago where I think it's Operation Anaconda, I think it was called. They arrested over 80 of their operatives. And this is a new cartel that is very militaristic and growing in Mexico. And they had over 80 arrests in the United States, you know, that uh, of members of them operating here. 